William? Oh, there you are. I see you now. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing great. How you doing? Well, I'm doing good. I have a visitor here. And she going to study with us. Oh, great. Great. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing that. Good, good. I'm welcome, good. Welcome to the study, right. and uh, we are delighted to have you with us. Mm -hmm. Hope that uh, we uh, say something that's encouraging to you tonight, and that will help you. Hello, Tiffany and Susan and Xerxes Reamer. Uh, Richard Esch, welcome. Um, appreciate you being on tonight. We're going to not spend as much time as we did in those previous studies. I'm trying to cut down a little bit on the time because uh, I know that kind of wears people down and some of you go to bed before we are done. So we're going to try to be a little bit more um, considerate in terms of our time. And so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Mark, how are you tonight? But we're going to talk about the kingdom of God. Uh, we still have people who have issues and problems with understanding the kingdom of God in the scriptures. Um, and so I want to talk about that a little bit. I've misplaced my glasses. Well, one pair of them. No, here they are. And um, get those ready. This time creeps up on me so fast. <laughs> um, it's just Elvin and I were talking about that a moment ago, how quickly the time you know, comes. And of course, you know, my days are busy, just like everybody else's. And, and you think you got, you know, 30 minutes left and look at the clock and it's like five minutes till or something. Are you doing Susan? It's good to see you, Martin. Uh, what's happening? What's happening? George, Stephen George. Good to see you, Scott. Welcome, 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 everybody. Uh, Gamaliel. And um, is that all one name? Gamaliel's Eliezer Reyes Rivas. Um, all right, that's a name. And um, so we're, let's talk about the kingdom of heaven tonight. Man, so many places to start. But uh, there are certain scriptures that I do want to go over and that we will cover. Uh, we get questions all the time about the kingdom and whether or not the kingdom has been established. And so tonight, we're kind of looking at the questions such as, um, uh, has the kingdom come? Or is the kingdom at hand? Or will there be a literal thousand years before the kingdom arrives? And uh, because, you know, we get that as an objection a lot of times. We talk to people about the coming of the kingdom. And one of the things that they uh, say is that, you know, we've got to have this literal thousand years uh, before the coming of the kingdom. I had someone ask me earlier today, was the kingdom of God present or has the kingdom come? something to that effect on Facebook. So I was going to answer the question, but I wanted to send a question to that person as well. You know, they had called me crazy or a lunatic or something. I don't know what they, you know, what they call me. Um, and I hope I don't forget, I got a huge announcement that I want to make before we're done tonight. And so I just asked them a question. And one of the questions is in the title that we have tonight, but they didn't answer it. I've been waiting, and I sent that question out last night, Elvin. When you were having your debate, did you um, did you see that question in the chat room? But I think I asked it right before you all changed from Facebook to um, to Skype. So I don't know if you all got an opportunity to entertain it or not. Do you recall? Uh, uh, we didn't get to have a chance to go over it. Uh, okay. Nobody wanted to, nobody wanted to touch on it, so. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> There's no problem. Howard, welcome. Uh, Scott, if I haven't called your name, John, uh, of course, I know I've called yours, Sandy, and Leon. Uh, welcome, welcome. Welcome, everybody. This is our All Things Fulfilled. Uh, we pretty much focused on Hebrew Israelitism, I guess you could say, uh, but we talk about things that are broader than that particular subject because the subject of eschatology is going to touch pretty much every subject out there. It's going to touch your pneumatology, your soteriology, uh, your theology, I mean, it's going to cover pretty much everything, and so uh, it's applicable for everybody. And, you know, years ago, when I was a seminary student, I realized that many of the problems that we have in our uh, belief systems today, as far as, you know, different divisions, denominations, etc., the root of the causes of most of those divisions was eschatology. Uh, I drew out a little diagram that I gave to my director, to the director of the school at the time, 
uh, showing him what the problems were and why people had these problems, why the Pentecostals, for example, had their issues with the Holy Spirit and the coming of the Lord, why the Jehovah Witnesses had some concerns about the end of the world and the coming of the Lord, why the dispensationalists had issues with the coming of the kingdom and the coming of the Lord, why the amillennialists, you know, had their uh, issues and uh, with, you know, bodily resurrection and various other things. And um, Adventists with when the law was fulfilled and so forth and so on. So all of those are eschatological issues when you uh, really get down to the brass tacks. Even the Mormons, when they talk about continued revelation until the coming of the Lord, all of these things are easily resolved when you get your eschatology correct. Now, that doesn't mean everybody's going to accept it, but I can tell you this, you're never going to get it right until you get that eschatology straight. And uh, even the doctrine of salvation is going to be a problem for uh, many, and it is because we hear it all the time uh, in terms of um, what people believe about it, when it occurs, et cetera, and the uh, atonement. And it's all because the eschatology is um, skewed in most of these views. And so we have a very simple view of eschatology. Now, the reason it seems complicated is because you've been looking out of your glasses this way, okay? And uh, they're, they're on backwards. And I'm not trying to insult anybody or anything, but they are basically on backwards. And um, once you turn them around, these things appear to be, or will be, a lot more simple and easy to understand. But it's just been the case that we've listened to things so long and our paradigms for trying to understand are based on those concepts that are not accurate. So when you're trying to filter through the truth, the truth is looking very strange because what you have seen, ooh, what is that? <laughs> what you have seen before is um, a view of eschatology that is incorrect. And so when you start seeing these things in the correct view, they look strange until you get used to them. All righty, so let's, uh, let's talk about that a, a little bit. Now, we know that the kingdom of God was not an afterthought. It was in the mind of God from the very beginning. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 34, when Jesus is, when the Son of Man has come in the glory of his Father um, to sit upon his throne, the Bible says in connection with that, I think it's verse 34, that um, when he speaks to those, to, to the righteous, to the ones on the right hand, he says, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Um, some people look at that maybe two ways, uh, it depends on your point of view. You can look at it from before the foundation of the world of, um, of uh, Israel, but you can also look at it from the beginning. Uh, and I believe that uh, it certainly was in the mind of God from that uh, point of view. But nevertheless, we can see that the kingdom of God has been in the mind of God for quite some time. Elvin, is this your screen that's popping up and changing like this? Somebody's screen is just going wild on me over here. <laughs> um, anyway, it's a little bit distracting over there to the left. And, and I guess it's just in the Zoom meeting. I don't know if you can see it on Facebook, but uh, it's probably uh, just in the Zoom, so we should be okay. All right. Um, was it, was, it, was, it, was it my screen? Yeah, I think it was your screen. It was just popping up with a lot of, um, you know, a lot of uh, images going on, and they kept flashing and, you know, distracting uh, for a minute. But we're, we're good. All right. Welcome, Greg and uh, Anna, et cetera. All right. So now with that, you have the kingdom of God in prophecy, and we're all familiar with the text in Daniel 2, at least most of us should be. And that's Daniel chapter 2, verses 44 and 45, resulting from the dream that um, Nebuchadnezzar had and that Daniel was to interpret and was, was privileged to interpret because of the favor of God in him, which the dream, uh, the rest of Nebuchadnezzar's uh, court and soothsayers, etc., all of the wise men of Babylon were unable to interpret. And so in verse 44, and I'll just cut to the chase, you know, with the image, et cetera, that he saw, and we'll just look at verse 44 and 45 for a moment. 
And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what was to come after this or come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. Now, this kingdom was to come uh, in the time of the fourth uh, beast, or, well, I'm getting chapter 7 wrapped up in here, but it was to come during the time of the um, uh, extremity of this image. In other words, the legs and the feet. And so if you were to place the image horizontally instead of vertically, you will see that it is actually a timeline. And so you have this head of gold, which represents Nebuchadnezzar, and then the uh, chest and arms of silver that represented the Medo-Persian kingdom. Following that was the belly and thighs of brass, which was the Grecian or Macedonian kingdom. And then following that, you have the Roman kingdom. Now, there's something else involved there that sometimes people do not see, and that is another kingdom, which in Daniel 7 is called the Little Horn. And the little horn is not a part of any of the other kingdoms. Uh, it is separate and different from those kingdoms. And then uh, in addition to that, there is a stone that is cut out of the mountain without hands. So if you were to um, look at that, you can see this uh, from a horizontal, po horizontal point of view. If you were to just draw a line at each segment that we just outlined, you will see the uh, timeline that's going on there. And all you have to do is go to Google, look up the dates of those kingdoms, and you'll get an idea of the time frame in which those kingdoms existed. Now, when you get to chapter seven, and I don't, I don't, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here. I don't have the time to uh, elaborate very much on chapter seven, but uh, it would make a good study, and one night I will do it. But now you have the same um, subject discussed under different images, and here it's the image of these various beasts, but they correspond precisely to the metallic images that are found in chapter 2. So in chapter 7, you have the uh, these four great beasts which come up from the sea, each different from the other. Uh, the first was like a lion. Well, the lion represents the head of gold, so that would be Babylon. And then you have uh, the beast, the second beast was like a bear, that would be the Medo-Persian kingdom. The third one was like a leopard, that is the Macedonian kingdom. And then the fourth beast was this great and dreadful, this terrible, exceedingly strong beast that had huge iron teeth and it was devouring and breaking in pieces, trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the other beasts that were before it and it had 10 horns. Now, let me just say this to those who try to interpret this especially the people who try to, who specialize in, in prophecy, uh, the tin horn beast remains a tin horn beast all the way through the prophetic uh, scriptures, all the way down to fulfillment. Now, here's what I hear a lot of times, and I've seen this uh, by various uh, Bible commentators, etc. When they're looking at the tin horn beast, especially as they try to interpret it in Daniel chapter uh, 7, they start doing addition and subtraction of these 10 horns, and that is absolutely incorrect. If you go to Revelation chapter 17, well, you could actually go to Revelation chapter 13, you could go to Revelation 17 and look at this beast, and you will see that it still has seven heads and 10 horns. It never changes from that. Throughout all the beginning of the prophecy until the fulfillment of the prophecy, it remains a seven-headed, 10-horned beast. And Daniel, even, I mean, uh, John even explains that in the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation. He tells you what the seven heads are, and he tells you what the ten horns are and what the ten horns do. So he doesn't say there were seven heads and then they added, uh, or, and ten horns, and then they added a horn to it that made it 11 horns, and then they subtracted three from that and it made it eight horns. Some people say three from ten, and it becomes seven horns. Now, that might be good math, but it's terrible hermeneutics. It's terrible interpretation. So uh, I would suggest that you don't do that. 
Now, it takes a little bit of, um, of you know, work to figure this out, but I'm just going to say it tonight, and then you go back and study it and see if it is the case, because this is not the main part of what I want to cover tonight. What I'm going to be covering is some basic stuff on the kingdom, and, uh, and then talking about a little more uh, detail as we go. But let's just look at this very, very quickly. All right, and so what he says was that this beast had seven horns, uh, seven heads and ten horns. Now, in verse 8, now this is where things began to get a little bit, um, uh, you might say, intricate in terms of detail and where you've got to really pay attention to what the text is saying. He says, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little horn. So he's not one of the ten, nor is he one of the first three. Because he's not the lion, he's not the bear, he's not the leopard, and he's not one of the ten horns. He's an altogether separate horn called a little horn. Now, the other part that is mentioned, it says, he came up among them. Now, that doesn't mean he's a part of them, but he comes up among them. That's just like you got a crowd of people standing here, and then someone from outside the crowd comes up among that crowd. Well, he's not a part of that crowd, but he is among that crowd. That's what's happening here, and that's what the, late, the text is saying. And then this statement here, before whom, now who's the whom there? The whom refers back to the little horn. In other words, this little horn comes up among the ten horns, which means that his activity, the focus of his activity, where all the action begins to take place, is during the time that the ten horns have come up. So if you keep in mind your horizontal timeline of that metallic image and lay the beasts out according to that, how you doing, Timothy? All right, and, and you lay the beast out according to that same uh, uh, timeline, then it is the, um, the little horn comes up during the time of the Roman Empire. Elvin has emphasized this over and over again in many of his studies that he has had. And one of the reasons, when you think about this, if you go back to chapter two, you will find when the stone that's cut out of the mountain without hands which means it's not an earthly kingdom. That phrase, without hands, and this is the first time it occurs in Scripture, is referring to a kingdom that is totally unlike all the other kingdoms that were mentioned. They are human kingdoms. Rhonda McDonald. I don't know if you're the Rhonda McDonald I know, but if you are, how are you doing? Um, and so this stone that is cut out of the mountain strikes the image not on its head, not on its chest, not on its belly or thighs, but on its feet. So that tells you where in the timeline the activity takes place, all right? And um, so that's, that's important. So what he's saying here is that before whom three of the first horns were plucked up. Now, the Bible did not say three of the ten horns were plucked up. It said three of the first horns were plucked up before him. Now, that doesn't mean he did the plucking up either. The word before indicates in the presence of. So these horns fell in the presence. Hey, uh, Tim, we've been getting a lot of positive comments on our discussion that we had. So Congratulations to you for a job well done. Uh, a lot of people love what we did. And um, so I appreciate that and I appreciate you for it. Okay. So this 10 horn beast, if you so, can. So hold on, Mr. Bell. Mr. Bell. Yes. So is uh, the little horn, will that be the 11th horn? No, 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 no. That's exactly okay. what I'm saying. It's not an 11th horn. See, when people say it's the 11th horn, they think that it's. Okay, you count 10 horns and you add one to it. Now you got 11. This horn is totally different. It's like two groups. It's a group of 10 and a group of one. Well, it's actually a group of three. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right, all right. 
I, but you're on the right track. You're definitely okay. on the right track. See, you had a group of three. Okay. Then you had this, because remember now, he said it was four beasts, right? Right. Now, three of them were like animals. Right. This fourth one was different from them in that he had seven heads and ten horns. Right. So he's a, a beast that's composite with these ten horns in it, right? Okay. And then, then you have a little horn. Okay, okay, I got you. So you we're working with, work with three groups. I got you, I got you. Right, so there you go. You got these three groups that's involved here. And then in addition to that, you have the stone that's cut out of the mountain without hands. So now you can hopefully see what's going on. So what he's saying in the text is, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one. So that's, that's an appositive that refers back to the noun horn, and so a little one coming up among them, before whom, so he's coming up among the ten horns, because what he's telling you is that something historically has occurred in the text, because he says before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. Now, he's not saying three of the ten horns were plucked up, because he comes among the ten horns. Uh, remember, in the timeline, his activity is among the ten horns. But three of the first horns have been plucked up in his presence. Now, there are people who take a historical perspective on Daniel chapter 7, and they try to stretch it out for centuries and talk about this is happening, and they go through all these elaborate historical men that have lived to tell you that this was this ruler, this was that ruler, this was this ruler, and we're on up into the 21st century with these rulers, and we're yet to have this prophecy fulfilled. That is baloney. It is as bogus as two left shoes. Uh, you know, I'm saying this in jest, okay? I'm just, this is just, I'm just making fun. You have to understand my humor sometimes. But I, I'm not trying to make fun. I'm just having fun. All right. And, um, but I'm telling you, that's not the way to interpret the prophecy. This little horn, see, if you understand this little horn, three of those first horns were plucked up in his presence. That's what the word before, just like I am before you right now, we're in each other's presence, even though we're doing it by electronic means, we're in each other's presence. So three of the first horns were plucked up in his presence. And that's what the text is saying. Before whom three of the first horns were plucked up. So that tells you that the little horn cannot be an individual. He's not some king or ruler. And the reason being, just think about it. How long did the Babylonian kingdom last? If you started from the time of Daniel down to the time that the um, Medo-Persians destroyed it. Even then, that's like 70 years but if you take the entire duration of the Babylonian kingdom, you know that it lasted longer than that. I don't have those dates in my head. Uh, Elvin, if you want to go out and pull them real quick and tell me what they are, that'll be fine. We can post it so people can have them. And you can just post them in the, in the chat room so people can have them. All right. So you have that length of time for the duration of the Babylonian kingdom. And then secondly, you have the time for the Medo-Persian kingdom. And then you have the time for the... Macedonian kingdom, the Grecian kingdom. All right, well, all three of those kingdoms fell in the presence of the little horn. Not by the little horn, it didn't say that. It says, before whom in his presence they were plucked up by the roots. Now, if Evan brings that information back, or if any of you, you can run out to Google real quick and just look up the dates, and some of you probably- Oh yeah, I'm working on it right now. Okay, Elvin's getting it, he's getting it, and he's going to plug the dates in for us so, so you can see. Now, my question to you is this. What man do you know survived all three of those kingdoms? And see, this is what people who say, well, this is the Antichrist coming, et cetera, et cetera. It's not going to work. Whomever this little horn is, he is an entity that existed from the time of the Babylonian kingdom all the way to the time of the destruction of the Medo, I mean, uh, the Grecian kingdom. And he was yet existing at the time of the Roman kingdom. 
So that's one thing that I believe you have to get. And he's an independent horn. He is not one of the ten horns. And when those three horns fail, get this, don't do the math and subtract them from the uh, ten horns, okay? Because that's going to mess you up really, really bad. Um, if you count all the horns in the text, you got the lion, the bear, the leopard, that's three, right? And then you have a fourth beast that has 10 horns. So if you just want to count them as independent horns, how many is that? That's 13. And then you have a little horn. How many is that? That's 14. And then you got a stone that is cut out of the mountain without hands. That's a horn too. This is a kingdom. So there are about 15 horns in the text. Now, if you do your math and you subtract three from that, what do you get? You're going to have your tin horns left, you're going to have your little horn left, and you're going to have your stone left. Now, I believe that is the way to understand the text. All right. Uh, let's see what he's got here. Um, let me go and take a look. In a second, we're doing a little checking here. All right, here we go. Thank you. I'm just going to copy them, Elvin, and post them out there for everybody. All right, put those in your notes, because I can't keep that stuff in my head. I'm like Henry Ford. When they asked him questions, he said, you know, I don't need to do that. That's why I got other people around me to, to keep facts, you know. Uh, I try to keep some, but my brain just doesn't work for historical facts a lot of times. All right. Tiffany, I would say that you're very, very, very um, close to the truth. Um, so close is scary. All right. How about that? All right. So now what you got then is look at those dates, 626 to 539 BC. All right. That's what? A hundred years or over a hundred years. And then you got 539 to 332 BC for the Medo-Persian kingdom. That's another 200 years, so we're looking at 300 years. And then from the Roman kingdom, that's about 100 and, I mean, 270-something uh, uh, years, if my math is correct. So add all of that together, and you're looking at roughly a 600-year period, right, if I'm not mistaken? Is that, that's roughly 600 years, just short of 600. I mean, uh, yeah, just round it off. Just say 600 years of history. Now. What man do you know who lives to be 600 years old? I mean, we're way past the antediluvian, the antediluvian area, right? Okay, your mic is muted now, so hopefully uh, that'll take care of that. We'll just see. All right. Hello, Andrea. Good to see you tonight. So now, let's, uh, let's continue on. All right, so now that you see there were three horns that were plucked up by the roots in the presence of the little horn. And um, I'm going to suggest to you, and please go back and study it, that those three horns are Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. They fell in the presence of the little horn, which tells you that the little horn has been in existence all the way through the history of these three horns. Now, it couldn't be Rome, because Rome wasn't in existence from the time that Babylon started. As If you look on the screen and you see what Elvin posted, the dates for Rome start 63 BC, all right? And so, um, so it's not Rome, and it can't be any of the three that were plucked up, so the little horn has to be something else. And it's not the kingdom of God, because the kingdom of God doesn't come until the time of Christ in the New Testament. So now we got this little mystery little horn here. And we need to figure out who he is. Now, I think I know who he is, but there are some more clues in the text that tells you about him, all right? And so um, let's just finish reading verse uh, 8. See, he says, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots, and there in this horn, see how he's singled out, were eyes like the eyes of a man. So he's given some human-like characteristics where everything else was a beast and a mouth speaking pompous words. All right, we move on through the 
uh, judgment scene that's mentioned here, which would take us to the Feast of Trumpets, because this is the time of judgment and the time of the opening of the books, which was another name for the Feast of Trumpets, all right? So this is judgment that's involved here. And But verse 11 picks back up with the little horn. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain. All right, so this little horn also witnesses the beast destruction, the, the slaying of the beast and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Well, you're looking at Revelation 20 here in terms of that. And then he says, and as for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. Now, let's uh, look in verse 20. Uh, well, well, we'll just start at verse 17. All right. In 17, he says, because, and here's the other part of that. In the first part of the vision, you have the vision. In other words, you have the vision that was communicated to Daniel. Now, there's always some obscurity in the vision. In other words, I think that we assume a little bit of uh, arrogance sometimes to try to interpret the vision before we get the Holy Spirit's interpretation of the vision. And so if you'll look at what Daniel said when he first saw that, this is what he said. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. So when he saw this vision, he was disturbed, gave him a headache. And if you've labored over these passages for any period of time, it'll give you a headache. <laughs> and so he says, I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. So it's the angel who actually gives the interpretation. And the interpretation is found in the following verses, uh, not necessarily in the previous verses. Chucky, uh, good to see you. So he says, those great beasts, let's just read them a little bit, which are four, are four kings, which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with its feet. Now watch this. Look at verse 20. And the ten horns that were on its head. So he still has his ten horns. He didn't lose a horn. And the other horn, look at the language, which came up before whom or before which three failed. Do you see how the phrase, how the text is saying that the three failed before the little horn? Just read it. I'm going to read it one more time. Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others. Exceedingly, see, he's not a lion. He's not a bear. He's not a leopard. The fourth beast was different from that. Uh, okay. All right. And so he's exceedingly dreadful. He has these teeth of iron and nails of bronze, which devoured and break in pieces and it stamped the residue with his feet. Then he says, and the ten horns that were on its head. So look at this now. He still has ten horns on his head. All right? But notice, I'm going to keep my hands up here so you can keep looking at the ten horns. I'm not the beast, okay? <laughs> Some people think I am because of the way I interpret these passages, but hopefully they'll come around. So here are your 10 horns, keep watching them. So he says, and the 10 horns that were on its head and the other horn, so now we gotta have another horn somewhere because the 10 are still here. And the other horn which came up, now watch this, before whom or before which, Three of the first horns. He didn't say three of the ten horns. He said three of the first horns. Fail. Well, who were those three first horns that are mentioned in the text? How you doing, Marilyn? 
Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece, which also tells you that the kingdom of God could not have come during the time of the Macedonian kingdom, because it has already fallen before the activity of the little horn coming up among the ten. That's very, very important. Because, see, we have people who want to tell us that the book of Daniel was fulfilled in the time of the Maccabees, fulfilled in the time of the Hasmonean dynasty. It's not going to work if you follow the text. Now watch. Namely, that horn that had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words whose appearance was greater than his fellows. See, he appeared to be stronger than his fellows. Why? All his fellows, at least three of them, had already hit, kicked the bucket, right? They're already gone. And yet, here's this little horn still there. Now watch verse 21. I was watching, and the same horn, now what horn is that? That's the little horn. He just mentioned the little horn, the one that had an appearance that was greater than his fellows. And so he says, I was watching, and the same horn, that same little horn, was making war against the saints. Now we've got something else introduced into the text, and that is the saints. So this little horn, now get it. Please get this. He has been in existence and watched the three first horns fall. He's in existence while the fourth horn exists. And during the time that the fourth horn exists, during the time that the fourth horn exists, he makes war against the saints. Now ask yourself this. When did the saints come on the scene? They didn't come during the time of the Babylonian Empire. They didn't come during the time of the Medo-Persian. They didn't come during the time of the Grecian. But they did come during the time of the Roman. And they didn't come until... There were saints, and I suggest to you that these saints are the believers in Christ. So this little horn makes war with the saints during the time of the fourth beast, not during the time of any of the previous three, because remember, they're gone. All right. And he does so, watch, he was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. He, it appears to be winning until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came, at the time of judgment, for the saints to possess the kingdom. Then he's going to reiterate this a little bit more. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be different from all the other kingdoms. This is the third time we're hearing it. And shall devour the whole earth trample it and break it in pieces, that's the Roman Empire, the ten horns, which are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, from within the Roman Empire, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones. The first ones are the three. Those are the first ones, if you stay with the text. And shall subdue three kings. It doesn't tell you how. Hello, Carol and Alvin. He shall speak pompous words, so there's your little horn, he's say, doing the same kind of speech, against the Most High, and shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Now I want you to think about who was it in the New Testament that was trying to change times and law? Who was it in the New Testament that was asking questions like, where is that promise? Or saying, we have heard him say this Jesus of Nazareth was going to destroy this place and change the customs delivered to Moses, or delivered by Moses. And see if 
that say, the same ones who were saying that were not persecuting the saints. But watch, the court should be seated. Well, I didn't read all the text. Then the saints should be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But the court should be seated, and they shall take away his dominion. See, he's a little horn. He's a little king. But don't underestimate him because of his size. Hello, Evelyn? Because he has watched three kingdoms get destroyed. And so then the kingdom, and uh, but the court should be seated. They shall take away his dominion. So his dominion is going to be taken to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and the dominion of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. And so when Daniel saw that, he says, uh, this is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me, and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. Daniel might have gotten a glimpse of exactly what that was all about. Now, it's rather interesting in the book of Daniel. If you go to De Daniel chapter 9, the Bible speaks about the 70 weeks when he said 70 weeks were determined for your people and for the sanctuary. To uh, And then talked about those six things, such as making an end of sins and um, um, making reconciliation for iniquity, finishing the transgression, bringing in everlasting righteousness, sealing up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. All of that is temple typology. When you look at it, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation of iniquity, etc. And then he tells you when that was going to end, he says it's going to continue, uh, or rather end, at the time of the consummation Um and um, it would end with the flood till the end of the war. Now, I think most scholars and informed interpreters understand that that was 70 AD. And that was the time that the temple was destroyed. So there you go, Tiffany. And so my understanding of the little horn is that the little horn was old covenant Israel. Did they exist when Babylon existed? Yes, they did. Did they see Babylon fall? Yes, they did. Did they exist when Medo-Persia existed? Yes. Did they see Medo-Persia fall? Yes. Did they exist when Greece existed? Yes. Did they see Greece fall? Yes. And were they around when the Roman kingdom came? Yes. Did they persecute the saints? Well, let's let the New Testament answer that. In Matthew chapter 23, the Bible says, uh, Jesus speaking to the uh, Pharisees in his day tells them that um, they were the murderers of the prophets. Or he says that they were the sons of those who murdered the prophets. And they said, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets, verse 30. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Watch, fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. See, their, their transgression wasn't finished. How are you doing, done? And so he, this is the finishing of the transgression. He says, fill up. See, their cup of iniquity wasn't full. So he says, fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of Gehenna? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. They're making war against the saints. They killed Jesus. They killed the apostles, some of them. And they persecute and kill Christians. They're making war against the saints. And they do that until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And so he tells him that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon 
this generation. Well, that tells you that the events of Daniel 7, of Daniel 2, of Daniel 9, and even Daniel 12 do not fall outside of the scope of that generation. And he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who stones the prophets, uh, uh, kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to you. How often I wanted to gather your children un under my arms as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. That's exactly what Daniel chapter 9 said. Now, if you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and um, look at 2, 14 through 16, Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica, and how are you doing, Emily, if I hadn't spoken to you? And Tarsha, welcome. Um, he said, for you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which, are, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans, who kill both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they do not please God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved so as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. So the wrath was coming upon those who were persecuting the Christians who murdered Christ and some of the apostles, etc. Those were the ones warring against the saints. And it was the coming of the Lord that was going to put an end to that and judge them for doing so in the time of the fourth beast. Now, all of that was introductory material. I intended to say none of that in terms of this lesson. But with the exception of just mentioning Daniel 2.44. Somebody told me I like to take the scenic route, so I guess I just did. Now, so let's talk a little bit about the kingdom and whether or not the kingdom is here. How are you doing, Christopher? Um, the prophets saw the kingdom from afar off. That has to be the case because when you read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through um, 10 through 12. I would suggest you note this passage down. It's one of my favorites. Here's what Peter said when he talked about the salvation. And the coming of the kingdom is also the coming of salvation as well. So Peter makes a statement in verse 9 where he says, receiving the end of your faith. The word end there is the Greek word telos, it means a goal reached, a point. It carries the idea of perfection. It's not sinless perfection. It means the completion of something that has been started. Okay? So perfect it. Bring it to its full end. And so while their salvation had begun, it was not consummated. Now, this is what throws people when they study eschatology. And this is why they can't get it together, because they see a beginning. Sometimes they even see a midpoint. And there is an, a terminal point. And what they do with their eschatology is they make the beginning point of a total different nature than the end point. And this is why they'll tell you, okay, we have spiritual salvation now. We're going to get physical salvation later. That's not right. That's why they're caught up with bodies coming out of the ground for their resurrection uh, doctrine. This is the perfection of what has already started. And by the way, the idea of the spiritual first and the physical, which is not even mentioned in the scripture, it's called natural, is reversed. See, I told you they have these glasses on backwards. If you read the text in 1 Corinthians 15 that speaks about the resurrection, verse 46 says, first the natural, then the spiritual. So if you want to make the word natural in 1 Corinthians 15 a body, which futurists do, I used to be one a long, long, long time ago. I got rid of that when I was in my 20s. And I'm almost eligible for Social Security now. <laughs> uh, 
the Bible says first the natural. So if you're going to make natural in 1 Corinthians 15 a body, a physical body, then you ought to have the resurrection at the beginning of, of the body coming out of the ground at the beginning and the spiritual sal uh, salvation later. But you see, they, they got it twisted. That's not Paul's order. Paul said, first the natural, then the spiritual. And he wasn't talking about bodies coming out of the ground in the first place. But that's what happens with amillennialism, dispensationalism, post-millennialism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. See, we got to get into the groove of the Hebraic mindset on bodily resurrection. And most people are not there yet. All right. And that's why eschatology is confusing to them as well. But it's really simple once you get the framework, once you get it down. And see, Peter is giving you some framework here. So he says, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now watch. Searching what or what manner of time. There are two basic elements you need to consider when you talk about eschatology. Now I'm supposed to be closing this call right about now because I said I wasn't going to be on long tonight. But anyway, I'm going to rock on a little bit here. I want to at least get to a couple of things. So he says, of this salvation, this would be a good point to start. Stop, though, wouldn't it? That'd be great. Raise your hand if you think this is a good point to stop. Um, they were searching what or what manner of time. And a lot of people, when we talk about eschatology, they start having all these hiccups over time when time is very predominant in eschatology in the scriptures, all right? The word eschatology itself implies time. And so they wanted to know what and the manner of time. So what Im indicates the nature? How is all this going to play out? And then secondly, in what time is it going to play out? Now, who was doing this? It was the prophets looking at this because this had been, they had seen visions of it. They had been given these prophecies and these visions of this coming kingdom. And we just read from Daniel, who wrote 600 years roughly before 1 Peter. And so he said, they were searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand, and you go right to Daniel chapter 9, and you can see in Daniel 9, he talked about the sufferings of Christ because he says after the 62 weeks, which added, add to that the seven weeks, so you got after the 69th week, which would have been in the 70th week, Messiah shall be cut off. There's the suffering of Christ. And that cutting off indicated a violent death. Then he said, and the glories that would follow. Let me check something out here very quickly. I got to talk with uh, Michael Holloway and find out a tip that he's using that makes this easy. Um, he seems to have it down. So I hope you'll help me out. But I want to look at something real quick and I'll tell you what it is in just a moment. Just doing a little checking. Uh, let's look at what the Greek New Testament says. Here's a little slow. Yeah. All right. Not a problem. All right. I was just double checking that. I was looking for the word, but I know where it is. Uh, so I'm going to go back and I'll show it to you. I was looking just to see if, when he said the glories to, uh, that would follow, if the word mellow was in the text. And mellow with the present infinitive means to be about to be, something that was soon to happen. So in other words, what the text would, Howard, how are you doing, man? Um, good to see you. 
look, you need to get me another trip back to uh, Orlando. <laughs> I need a vacation, right? Okay. Um, well, let's, let's, um, so, but when you look, however, if, if you go to chapter five, you'll actually see the word, it, it, the word is in the text. So while it's not in verse one of chapter, I mean, verse 10 of chapter one, it's actually in verse one of, of chapter five. So watch what Peter says. The elders who are among you, I exhort, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker of the glory that is about to be revealed. Shirley, how are you? So the word mellow is in the text. Now, let's go back and read 1 Peter with that light. If you go back to 1 Peter and read it again, Here's what the prophet saw. They testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that were about to be revealed. Now, don't get lost right there because he's not saying that it was about to be revealed in the prophet's day because he's going to tell you that he's going to explain himself in the next verse. Watch verse 12. To them it was revealed that not to themselves. So, even though they saw the sufferings of Christ and a glory that was going to follow very shortly thereafter, it was not for their time. That's why they were inquiring, when is this going to happen? How is it going to play out? What's the nature of it? But see, when we get these modern day prophets, read the scriptures, because they ignore these time factors that the prophets knew were in the scriptures and the apostles knew were there, we come up with this spandex eschatology. Just stretch it and stretch it and stretch it as far as you want it to go. Because I don't see anything like that has ever happened. So it must not have happened. They are not considering the evidence. You know, if you have a crime scene, just put yourself right now, put yourself, <laughs> Tim said, I can stop as long as I come back to finish it. I will not promise that. Because uh, <laughs> my mind will be way somewhere else the next time you see me. Uh, <laughs> put your mind, you know, put on your Sherlock Holmes or your Columbo or your Perry Mason hat right now, okay? And let's say that a crime has been committed. Or we're going to investigate a crime. Let's say we're going to investigate a crime. And you go to this house and um, the diamond safe is open, all the diamonds are gone, all the cash is gone, all the expensive, you know, artwork is gone off the walls, etc. The house is ransacked. But you see no evidence, I mean, you see no sign of the criminal, the person who did this. So because you don't see the person who did it, but you see all the evidence that something has been done, you say, well, I guess no crime has been committed because I don't see the person who did it. How long was Sherlock Holmes and Perry Mason and Columbo? And what was the detective that had the lollipop? What was his name? Uh, Cujo or something? <laughs> Whatever. You, anyway, you know who it was. How long would they have lasted? Or Dick Tracy? I mean, you know, interpreting uh, or trying to analyze a crime scene like that. Well, you know, I don't see the criminal. Everything is missing, but apparently no crime has been has occurred. See, here's what you know. You know, based on the evidence, that a crime was committed. And you also know, because you got there after the crime, that it was committed at a certain time. So you have those two things. You have the evidence that something happened and you have the time frame in which it happened. So you can't look at that crime scene and say, well, I guess this crime never happened, so maybe it'll happen after a thousand years, or maybe it'll happen 
and then I'll find who out who the criminal is. That doesn't make sense, does it? No, you got to investigate that crime scene and you got to go find all the clues that points to someone who would have been in that place at that time. That's what you're looking for. You can't go to another crime scene, et cetera. You got to take that crime scene. That's why they don't want you disturbing the evidence. And the too many, too many interpreters disturb the evidence. Kojak, that's him. Thank you. The lollipop detective. All right. So we shouldn't be disturbing the evidence. When you start going to the script and say, all doesn't mean all, uh, shortly doesn't mean shortly, quickly doesn't mean quickly, at hand doesn't mean at hand, and um, mellow doesn't mean about to be, you are disturbing the evidence and trying to solve the problem. That's not going to work. You do that at a crime scene. They tape up the scene so you can't get to it. You can't disturb it. You have to interpret those facts as they lay there. Now, the text says to them, it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us. See, the prophet said this, catch this now, not to them who lived 600 years before. But here's what Peter said but to us. He didn't say to, the, to us who lived 2,000 years afterward. To us, those are first century disciples. So if we're going to analyze this crime scene, if you please, we've got to find the evidence within someone who was at the scene of the crime. And that would be the people in the first century. But to us, they have ministered the things, watch this, which now have been reported to you, first century saints, through those who have preached the gospel to you. That's a past tense, meaning they'd already preached the gospel to them. Not people who had never heard the gospel in the 21st century. By the Holy Spirit, which had been poured out on Pentecost. Sent from heaven things which angels desire to look into. And that's why he told them in the next verse, therefore gird up the loins of your mind and hope to the end. See, that's the same end that he just talked about, receiving the end of your faith. For the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation, the apocalypsis, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. And that's the same word revelation that's used in the book of Revelation, where the Bible says in the first verse, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his servants things which must shortly come to pass. I'll pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is at hand. It's near. If you can't make your eschatology fit within an at hand, shortly, quickly to come to pass, about to happen time frame in the first century generation, throw it out. It's not right. So, Peter has told you, not in the time of the prophets, but it's in our time. Now, let's see if we can find some kingdom facts that align with that. And I'm going to finish up in 45 minutes or less for tonight's study, okay? Um, and then we're done. So at least you won't have to be up to 10 o'clock. 9 o'clock is pretty good bedtime, even if you're on Eastern time. Or 10 o'clock, I guess, is for you. So now, what do we have in the New Testament? Since it wasn't for the time of the prophets, and Peter said it was for us, meaning people in his generation, we should see some indication that the kingdom was near in the time of the first century. Do we have any such evidence? Let's go to Mark chapter 1, and the verse is 14 and 15. Well, before we do that, let's just go to um, 
Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. All right, in Matthew 3, these are the days of Tiberius Caesar, and he reigned, I believe, somewhere between 15 AD to around 30 AD, some, somewhere around there. But it says, in those days came, or, or John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, has drawn near. Doesn't that make sense? Since Daniel said, it's not for our time. And then Peter says, the prophet said, it's not for us, or at least Peter said that. It's not for their time but they were prophesying for us, for those first century saints. And then here you have John the Baptist earlier saying, repent for the kingdom has drawn near. So there's a near fact. The word at hand means imminent. It means something about to happen soon. If you go to chapter four and verse 17, you have the Lord saying the same thing. But before we get to the Lord's statement, I want to read his read a statement out of Mark 1 before we get to Matthew 4, 17, which is a parallel to um, uh, the statement John made. But let's look at Mark and see what Mark said. Because in Jesus' words in Mark, it's a little bit more definitive and emphatic. In verse 14, it says, Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time. Now, the word time there is kairos, and it means appointed time. In other words, there was an appointed time for this event to take place. Now, I have a dental appointment on Tuesday. Wait a minute, wait a minute. My wife just came in. It's on the 2nd of May, whatever day that is. All right? It's set. It is an appointed time. Now, I could go on down to the dentist today or even tomorrow, and they're not going to see me. My dentist is very good. Her office stays full, and if you don't come by appointment, you are not going to get seen. See, if I go today or tomorrow, I'm too early. The prophets, if you put the kingdom in the time of the prophets or the Maccabees, you're too early. If I go on the 30th of the month, I'm too late because there is an appointed time. They sent me a card. They sent me an email, and they made a phone call. They want to make sure I know the time. All right. So I have an appointment, and that's what the Bible says. The appointed time, the appointment for the kingdom is fulfilled. The word, um, what's the next word in the text? It is fulfilled, okay? That word in the Greek is pleroma. And it's actually in the perfect tense. So it's peple Roma. Meaning that the time has come and has been fulfilled. In other words, this appointed time has arrived and stands as having come. And there is no other time that can fulfill this. This is why understanding some of these Greek words is important. And I'm brushing up on my Greek now. Yeah, I got the books. And Tiffany, my desk doesn't look as bad as it did last week. I had it clean yesterday. It's getting back junky again. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm working. But it's important. Heply <laughs> roti. That's a perfect tense in the Greek which means it stands as having been completed at a time in the past with existing results continuing into the future. How are you doing, Mark? So this time for the kingdom is there. 
There is no other time. There's no other appointed time. Even Jesus had an appointment. The Bible says, when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. So he came at his appointed time. Um, now, watch. Saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. So it's at hand when? In that appointed time. And therefore, repent and believe the gospel. Now, I didn't say very much about it, but John the Baptist was one of the precursors or signs of the nearness of the day of God. Remember, God said, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet. Well, Matthew 17, 1 through 14, and um, Luke 1, 16 and 17, John the Baptist was the Elijah that Malachi said was going to come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. See, all the evidence is lining up. It's right there. Just don't move any of it. If anything moves, if the evidence doesn't fit, it ought to be your brain, your mind, your, your mindset. And we don't like moving the mindset. We like moving God's word around. Well, let me shift this and put this piece over here. You know, you, you ever seen people try to put a <laughs> try to put a jigsaw puzzle together and the piece doesn't fit, and they're just gonna take it and fit and, and just tear it up trying to make it fit in a place that it doesn't fit. Hey, Mr. Bell. Yes, sir. Also, the uh, another uh, thing that I just actually had a, rec uh, a revelation about was, uh, and not to go back too far, but with Daniel seven twenty six and twenty seven, that's that's pretty much what you're touching on about the kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. So Daniel seven twenty six and twenty seven is actually found being fulfilled in Matthew twenty one and twenty two. Yes. Yes, because he said the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Yes, sir, after the judgment was set. Exactly, exactly. Uh, that's that's definitely the case. I was going to touch on it somewhere. I didn't know whether I'd have time to get to it, but thank you for bringing it up. Um, Michael, good to see you. Okay, so now we got this appointed time for the kingdom. Now, having seen that, that we're in the right time frame, we're in the right setting, it's an appointed time, it stands as fulfilled, you can't have another time that has come and that stands fulfilled with existing results other than that time in the first century. And um, Ben Abraham, good to see you. So now what I want to do is look at um, a text in Matthew 16. I talked about this last week, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it but just to bring the text back up. In Matthew 16, oh, the, well, let me go, I'll do this one, and then I'm going to go back to another text because I want to talk about something. And I'm working on this 36 minutes that I got left, okay, or less. So in Matthew 16, 27 and 28, and I explained that well in last week's lesson, so go back and look at it if you need to. Good to see you, Alan. Um, the text says, for the Son of Man is about to come. There's our word mellow again in the text. I don't know why the translators wouldn't put it there. You know, you have to understand that translators have doctrinal views too. So do lexicon writers and everything else. And it amazes me sometimes when you take a, a, a lexicon and you can see how they will properly define the word and then they will give you an interpretation that violates or contradicts the definition that they just gave you. But that's because, as I said, it's harder for us to change our mindset. And so we try to manipulate the word of God. For the son of man is about to come in the glory of his father with his holy angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not die, who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That is not a Pentecost text. Verse 27 is judgment. I covered that thoroughly last week, I think, and so I'm not going to belabor it at this point. But he says that the kingdom would come before some who were standing in his presence died. Now, some of them would die, and they did before he came. 
can read the book of Acts and you can see how some of them died. But some of them were alive. As a matter of fact, you even have a text in John 21 and verse 21 through 23 when he talks about Peter dying, etc., being carried where he didn't want to go. And um, when Peter asked, well, what would this man do about when he asked about John? He says, what if I will that he remain till I come? Indicating that John would possibly still be alive when Jesus came. Now, they say John lived almost into the second century. If that is the case, with Jesus coming in 70 AD, then John lived until he came. And um, that's what I believe actually occurred. He didn't say John would never die, which was the rumor that went around, that he would never die physically. And so I believe he died after that. But he did live until Christ came. See, those are those time clues in the text. All right, so he tells you that. But what I want to do here is go to, um, to Matthew 6 very quickly and look at the prayer. And the reason I go here is because people quote passages out of this prayer and use it to say the kingdom is yet to come, that the kingdom has not arrived. That's correct, Alan. It is already here. And that's what we're dealing with. And so when Jesus teaches his disciples to pray. He says in verse 9, In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Now you have to understand where they were standing historically when that statement was made. That was before 70 AD. It is before even Pentecost, where we would say the kingdom had a beginning. But they could pray that the kingdom come. And, if, and, and I believe this entire text is an eschatological text. And so thy kingdom come would refer not to Pentecost, uh, but to the judgment, the time of judgment, the consummation of the kingdom. And so he says, in this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And people will look at this and say, well, God's will has not been done on earth. I beg to differ. God's will was that the kingdom would come, that the principles of the kingdom would be taught, and that all things written would be fulfilled. And that has been done. And he has judged those who were righteous and those who were wicked. We um, saw that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I just want to touch on some things. But this is, and I didn't get a chance to look this one up, um, but I found it to be a unique construction in the Greek. It is the um, imperative passive. And um, so I want to look that up. I do know that there are some statements that are made relative to this that will say, um, and it appear as though, uh, and let me see if I can get one. Um, there's one in Matthew 16, 19. And so I was looking to see if it was the same text. And, you know, those of you who are Greek scholars, you can look this up or you can call me and give me some information. I would appreciate it. But he says, I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Now, it sounds like he's telling the apostles to bind something on earth, and then he's going to bind that in heaven. No, that's not what he's saying. That's kind of backwards. That's putting the, the apostles in the authority instead of heaven in the authority. And see, that would even contradict Matthew 6. Because if you look at Matthew 6, it says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But what he's actually saying from the study that I did on this is that whatever you bind on earth 
will already have been bound in heaven. In other words, all they're doing is binding what heaven has already bound. We can't change the gospel and bind something that the gospel doesn't teach. So they're binding on earth what was already bound in heaven, and that would fall in line with Matthew 6 and verse uh, 10. And so he says, um, give us this day our daily bread. It's an interesting term here, uh, episusion bread. And you might want to look that up, but it's a um, kind of the idea of the manna in the wilderness. Uh, I'm trying to recall the meaning of that term. Epi means above or upon. It eludes me at this point, but it's an interesting word. I would suggest you look it up. But that's the idea of the manna in the wilderness. Is it the ground outside? Uh, try in the earth. I'm not following you on that statement. On the earth as it is in heaven, um, your will be done on earth. And no, I don't think it's the ground outside, if I'm understanding your your um, question. Um, but, Alan, we can talk about that, make sure I'm following what you're saying. But give us this day our exousion bread. All right, so, or oh, episousion bread, something to that effect. I'd have to look up the term, and I don't have time right now. But, well, maybe I do. My curiosity gets the best of me. So, Matthew chapter 6, and the verse is 11. Epiusion. Okay, not Seuss, but Epiusion. All right, Epiusion. And let me see if I can find the meaning of that um, real quick. Epi, eon, I mean like on the coming day, the next day, but the eyes of it is rare. All right, just said it was made by the evangelist to produce that. Okay, so nobody knows what it is so far among the scholars. When a word is not recognized at sight. I'll tell you where you can find the word if you look... Um, What's his name? Um, da, 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 da. I'm trying to see. Is it Scott McKnight? I don't think it's Scott McKnight. Um, I'll get the book and post it. I'll post it later where you can find the meaning of the term. But I just want to say to you that it's it's kind of the idea of the, um, I mean, look, just think about it. Just 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 reason for a second. Give us this day our what? Our daily bread. Just think about that for a moment. Now, where did you see a concept like that before? It was during the Exodus. When they were to gather manna enough for each day, right? So they were being fed daily. In other words, it's a transition concept, a transition from the bondage of the Exodus to the promised land, the kingdom representing the promised land. That's the idea uh, that's uh, spoken of here. Um, uh, and I'll pull that, that definition for you later. But I suggest you study it. The commentators, because it's such a unique term, um, you won't find... Well, at least I didn't find in that quick reference that I looked up, they, they didn't have a clue what it was all about. But if you put it in the context of the Exodus, it should make a little bit more sense to you from that statement, give us this day our daily bread or our, um, now it's beginning to come to me. I saw the name Deborah and something just clicked. <laughs> How are you doing, Deborah? Um, the Epiusion bread. Now, if you think about the manna during the wilderness, this was bread from heaven that God supplied. In other words, he was their source. 
And so when you look at it here, here are the saints going through this time of trial and uh, persecution in the first century. They're being tested, and God is their supply. That's the kind of idea. So it's like going through the Exodus, and God is their supply. They're living off bread from heaven. Okay, anyway, so much for that. And so forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Or transgressions. So this is the period of the finishing of the transgression or the rec making reconciliation for iniquity. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. There is the deliverance from Satan. So here's your millennium. Why? Because Satan is destroyed at the time of the judgment and cast into the lake of fire. So the millennium has to be going on at this time. This is where your thousand years fit. Now, I asked the question about the thousand years. Now, I want to think about this because, remember, this is kind of a Hebrew-Israelite class as well. And they're not the only ones, but we get this from the dispensationalists and, you know, everybody who doesn't want to accept those imminent time statements. Let me read this while I, I'm, I'm at it, Okay. Since we have so many people that want to uh, change the time. Where is it? It's in Ezekiel chapter 12. See, God was speaking of soon an imminent time back during the time that um, Babylon, I mean, yeah, was about to destroy uh, Jerusalem. And they had this proverb going that um, the vision fails. See, they were basically asking, where is the promise of this coming that Jeremiah and Ezekiel has talked about? Where is it? And they were going about their business like nothing was going to happen. Even Josephus records that as well. Uh, but they said, son of man, what is this proverb? This is Ezekiel 12, 22, that you people have about the land of Israel, which says the days are prolonged and every vision fails. In other words, they're saying a thousand years, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. That's in essence what they were saying. They were using it to say the vision is prolonged. That's not the way Peter used it, but that's the way they use it. And that's the way people use it when we talk to them about the imminent return of Christ in the first century. They, they want to go to 2 Peter 3, verse 8, and they want to talk about a long time and that is the total opposite of what Peter was using, that the manner in which Peter was using it. And basically what he was saying was, look, when God makes you a promise, if he says in the day that you eat, you will die, he means in a day. If he says after 400 years, I will deliver you, he means after 400 years. He, if he says at the set time, I will come and Sarah will have a child, he means in a year. If he says the time, times, he means in three and a half years, et cetera. So if he says in this generation, he means in this generation, he is never going to renege on his time promise. And that's all is, that is being said. That's basically what's being said in 2 Peter 3. Uh, but there's a little bit more to it as well. But anyway, so they're saying the time is prolonged. And here's what God says to them. Tell them, therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will lay this proverb to rest, and they shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel, but say to them, the days are at hand, and the fulfillment of every vision. That's for those some time people. You know, you talk time, and they say, well, some. No, he says all things. And here he says everything. The days are at hand, and the fulfillment of every vision. That Jeremiah and Ezekiel prophesied regarding the destruction of that temple. He says, for no more shall there be any false vision or flattering divination within the house of Israel. For I am the Lord. I speak, and the word which I speak will come to pass. It will no more be postponed. For in your days, see, in their generation, in your days, O rebellious house, I will say the word and perform it says the Lord God. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, look, the house of Israel is saying the vision that he sees is for many days from now. 
See how they try to put that thousand years in there? And he prophesies of times afar off. That's what the futurists tell us. They look at all the evidence. All and the fact that a crime has been committed, so to speak, and they say, well, no, the crime didn't really happen then. It's going to happen in their future. The vision that he sees is for many days from now, and he prophesies of times afar off. Tim, how are you? The other Tim, Tim Ogles. Therefore, say to them, thus says the Lord God, none of my words will be postponed, which I speak. Or, or rather, will be postponed anymore. But the word which I speak will be done, says the Lord God. And that's the way we need to look at these prophecies in the New Testament and the time frame when they said they were at hand and about to come, that they would not be postponed, that they would be done. And they would happen in their generation. So if we're looking at him saying, but deliver us from the evil one, Romans 16, 20, Paul wrote and said, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. See, there's a short time for the destruction of Satan. People walking around, the devil made me do it. Satan is still here. You're possessed. Why did Paul write that God will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Take him to be what you want. I'm not going to have that debate tonight. Whatever he was, he was destroyed shortly. If you read Revelation 12 and verse 12, it will say, the devil is now come down to you. He's, he's angry and has come down to you because of something he's been, let me read it. He's been cast to the earth. I don't want to butcher up the text. Let's just read it. All right. Therefore rejoice, O heaven, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. The devil knew it. How come Christians don't know it? He didn't have a long time. He didn't have a thousand years. When the book of Revelation was written, they were at the close of the thousand years, not at the beginning. They were almost over. And what would happen after that? Well, after the judgment scene of Revelation 20, you have the kingdom because they are seated with Christ on the throne. So, I want you to think about this, especially for the Hebrew Israelites, if you're on the line tonight, on the call. Now, you go around telling people that you are enslaved and oppressed because of Deuteronomy 28, 68. And because you don't believe that the kingdom is here. And when we tell you that the kingdom was at hand, and Peter tells you, three times specifically, but he tells you more than that in his first epistle. He says he was about to judge. Who, who will give account to him who is about, or who is ready, excuse me, the word hetormos, who is ready to judge the living and the dead. That's 1 Peter 4, 5. That's his first epistle. In verse 7, he says, be vigilant and be sober um, for the, and be watchful in your prayers for the end of all things is at hand, has drawn near. So there's Peter telling you again, the end of all things is drawn near. And then in verse 17, he says, for the time has come that the judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it get, begins first at us, what will be the end of those who do not, what will the end be of those who do not obey the gospel? So three times in one chapter, Peter said, God was ready to judge the living and the dead. The end of all things had come and the time of the judgment had come. All right, skip over a couple of pages to the second epistle, chapter three. And Peter says, beloved, I now remind you of those things that I told you before. Well, now, if you remind them of what you told them before, then what could the judgment be about in second Peter three? The same 
judgment whose time had come. Not something days far off in the future. And because they see that thousand year thing in there, that verse, they want to try to stretch it out and say it's a thousand years. So here's my question to you, Hebrew Israelites. If the kingdom is not here today, in the year 2019, and a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, so you're going to make it a thousand years, a literal thousand years, and this is for all the futurists who want to interpret the passage that way. And you're in slavery, oppression. Why are you even expecting to go to the land in your lifetime? Since you know you are not going to live for a thousand years. You might as well go home and sit down and wait. Or just do whatever. Because you're not getting out of this oppression that you claim you're in for another thousand years. So how do you like your own argument? But see, that's what happens when you fight against God. So what about it? All of you who are trying to preach the rapture, we just had some dates that fail. I didn't keep up with them this time, but I think we just had some dates. Yeah, because we're in the, uh, aren't we in a Jewish feast day or something about now? Um, some people were claiming the rapture was going to occur. Well, see, when you get in debates with us, you want to pull your Second Peter 3.8 and talk about a thousand years is a long time. But then when you get your rapture hat on, then it's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> you forget all about your thousand years. You'll even set a date and say the rapture is happening on this date. No thousand years in sight. How consistent is that? Okay. All right. 848. I got to wrap up here. So what do we have? We've shown you the prophecy of the kingdom. We've shown you that it would come in the time of the fourth beast. We've shown you that it would come in the time when they're persecuting the saints. I've given you Matthew 6 through 9 that talks about the second exodus. That's really what that prayer is about. It's about the second exodus, the daily bread, etc., the destruction of Satan, which would mean uh, grace for India. How are you doing? Um, that um, the millennium is already present. It's already ongoing. Okay. At the time that, well, it, it hasn't started necessarily when this prayer was offered, but it was about to start. And you could say that it was, it, it had uh, started in terms of what Christ was doing, but you know, either way, it's fine. Um, So we saw that the kingdom would come before some who stood in the presence of Jesus died. And none of them are alive today, which means that either you're calling Christ a liar or you believe that some people from the first century are still walking around on this earth. And then you have in Luke, which is where the dispensationalists clashed with the amillennialists, with R.H. Bowl and his eschatology and many others. See, this is that already but not yet of the kingdom because it has an already but not yet as well. And this is why some people will say, well, okay, we, you know, they may think you're talking spiritual and, and you're talking something else. Jacqueline Lee, um, are you one of my former high school schoolmates or no? I, I was just asking. Um, at any rate, so in Luke chapter 21, well, before I go to Luke, let's go to, because I'm going to end up there. So we'll just end there. Uh, Takata, we're just about to get out of here, but fortunately for you, everything is recorded, so you'll be able to go back and listen to it. So let's look at a couple of passages real quick. Um, first of all, we have Colossians chapter 1 and the verses 13. 
Colossians 1 and verse 13. And the scripture there says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. So they were beginning to enter the kingdom already. That's an already, but not yet of the kingdom. But they're doing this in the first century. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. In Revelation 1 and verse 9, John said, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island of Patmos, or that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So he said, I'm in the kingdom. And it still hadn't fully come, but they were extremely close at that point. So when, in fact, did it arrive at the time of judgment? Matthew 25 says in verse 31, then, uh, excuse me, uh, 31 of 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him. Now we read Matthew 16, 27 and 28 that he was about to come in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. And then he would reward each according to his works. That's the judgment text. And he said, assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not die or taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Well, you got to take that verse and match it with this verse. You can't make one or pit one against the other. The same uh, temporal um, evidence that are found in Matthew 16, 27 must be carried over into Matthew 25 and 31. Both of them are judgment texts. Both of them are about the coming of the Lord to judge, right? To reward each according to his works, isn't that precisely what's going on in Matthew 25? When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and we pointed out last week from Matthew 22, what verse 20 or 21, and uh, I think Matthew 20, 21 and 22, and also Mark 10 and 37, where he interchanged glory for the kingdom. So when you talk about coming in the glory, you're talking about coming in the kingdom. Remember we read in 1 Peter earlier tonight where Peter says, I am a partaker of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that is about to be revealed. So he's saying, and the kingdom which was about to be revealed. When the Son of Man comes in the glory of his Father and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. That's the kingdom. And then what does he do? He exercises judgment. But Matthew 25, as I pointed out before, is a parallel to Luke chapter 21. And Luke just uses one verse to talk about it. So let's read Luke very quickly, and we're going to wrap this up. In Luke 21, beginning at verse 20, the Bible says, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. In other words, okay. Now, if you were to see armies surround your city, and they all got loaded guns and tanks and everything, what would you be thinking? Especially if they don't have USA uniforms on. I'd be thinking something was about to go down. And I wouldn't be thinking that it's going to happen 2,000 years from now if they're already surrounding the city. He says, then know that it's desolation is near. Well, the desolation spoken of is what Daniel talked about in Daniel chapter 7 and verse and chapter 9. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Write that down. Take note of that. Flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart and let not those who are in the country enter her for these are the days of vengeance. Another very powerful eschatological theme, that all things which are written 
all things, not some, not almost all, not all but three verses or three chapters, all which are written may be fulfilled. Verse 27 talks about the coming of the Lord in glory and power. Verse 28 talks about their redemption drawing near. Verse 31 talks about the kingdom coming. And then he says in verse 32, assuredly I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. So he locks it in to that generation. Now there's the evidence. It's right there in front of you. You can walk away from it and say nothing ever happened. Because you don't like the time that the crime occurred. Well, no, this crime should have been committed in the year 2000. I don't care if they said, and all the evidence points to the fact that it happened then. It could not possibly have done that because that's not the way I see it. That's pride, arrogance, sort of a rebellious spirit, not willing to listen to the Holy Spirit. Some of it could be just, you know, ignorance and not knowing. But once it's pointed out to you, there's no excuse. Now, another text I wanted to talk about um, in the last three minutes, two and a half minutes, and that is Luke 17. Remember I told you to remember the word reveal and the fleeing to the housetop? Watch. In Luke 17, 30, after he talks about what happened in the days of Noah and what happened in the days of Lot, he says, even so it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. That's the word apocalypse, same word in Revelation. In that day, he who is on the housetop. Well, he just told you in Luke that that would happen when the temple was destroyed and when all things written would be fulfilled. And now he says, this is the day of the coming of the Son of Man. When he says, let him who is on the housetop and his goods in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Well, ladies and gentlemen, friends, and if I have any enemies online, bless your hearts. That's the end of the study tonight. Um, I hope and pray that it's been a blessing to you and uh, beneficial to you. You may not have agreed with everything I said. And you don't have to. But I do challenge you to go back and study the information. If you took some notes, look into those notes and see if the things that we've said did not align with the scripture. And if you find something that you feel does not, bring it to my attention. I'm an open person. I may press my points hard, but I have a mind that says I'm searching for the truth and that's what I'm looking for. Now I want to um, uh, put this up for you, for those of you who have stayed around and I hope that you, um, hope that everybody was able to hang around, but I know that's not possible. So I'm going to put my website here. And um, I want to make an announcement. Starting on June the 8th, we will be broadcasting on cable on a cable TV network. You're welcome, Susan. Reaching potentially 30 million people with this message. And um, we'll also be featured on a website that gets over 100,000 hits per day and also has international exposure. So coupled with our ongoing radio program, which we intend to keep, as long as we can sustain the expenses. We will now have a 30 minute television broadcast or it'll be on cable TV. And I, as I understand it, there's also a Roku channel that's involved and they're currently adding more stations. So now we'll be able to broadcast right into the homes of people. Now there are some of you on this line who listen to us all the time uh, that we've taught, we've helped, and, um, and we hope that you 
you know, appreciate the message. If you do, we have a donate button on our website. And I don't necessarily like to ask people, you know, to do things, but if it's something for the Lord, I don't mind asking. And we're not asking you for a lot. If you can find within your heart and within your budget to, um, you know, make a monthly contribution because we're looking to stay there for the long haul. We don't want to just pop in and pop out because we know there's a tremendous amount of work to do. Um, a $5 a month, a $10, you know, maybe 15 and 20 if you can stretch that. Now, I'm not going to put any limits on you. I'm just telling you what my expectations are. Um, I've asked some people and they've complied with, you know, one or the other. And some of them said, oh, I'll do much more than that. That's totally up to you. We do have some things that we have to put together. I talked to a brother today and he said he's going to come to town and help me, you know, set up some things, which I was going to need that as well. And so there's work involved in this process. And this is all for the furtherance of the word. So those of you who are, you know, convinced that this is the truth and uh, want to see this message spread. And I know there are some of you on here who already know about it and you've already done that. And I appreciate that very much and others um, who are preparing to do so. But this is a tremendous opportunity. And we're hopeful that, um, you know, Don Preston gets an opportunity to do it. I have already um, signed my contract. I did that today, turned it in. And um, so we're ready to roll as far as, you know, that part is concerned. Uh, the first broadcast will air, and I have a prime time spot, which is 7.30 p.m. on a Saturday night. And that is uh, starting on June the 8th. And so we intend to be broadcasting, you know, um, through a pre-recorded broadcast, but that is going to be uh, on cable TV and um, covering, you know, potentially 30 million homes here in the U.S., across the country, and uh, potentially to other places. All you have to do is go to the website. Let me explain um, how it works. If you'll go to the All Things Fulfilled website, just click the link. And when you click the link, you will see a donate button just below the video. Click on the donate button. And when you click on that button, a window will come up with zeros in it. We want you to put some numbers there, whatever your heart moves you to put there, and that you can hopefully, you know, do on a consistent basis without it bothering you. And that's why we ask for, you know, a, a low amount. And again, you know, you be the judge of what you can do and what you're willing to do. If you feel like you can only do, you know, a one-time amount and you want to do more and it just make it one time, of course, that's acceptable. We're not going to turn down anything. But I'm just telling you that we want to be able to do this on a consistent basis. We haven't quite been a year on our radio program, but we're hearing from people around the world on that radio program. And I know it's done some good. There are some people on this call who have benefited by that radio program. Um, and so on that screen, let me not, let me stay focused. Um, once you put in that amount, then there's a little block underneath that on the next line that says, make this a monthly amount. If you're gonna make it a monthly amount, check that. And then uh, just finish the process and, and it'll be done. It'll send a notification, we'll get that. At the end of the year, you know, we'll send you a statement for what you've contributed so that you know you can uh, use that for your records and um, um, and if we need to contact you and get your address we will do that because we do send you know the letters out but that's what we're looking at and we're excited about it um, you know I, I thought that one day I might be able to do something like this I didn't know that it would happen like it did or so soon but hey this is an opportunity and I didn't want to see it pass up and so uh, we've done it now something else that we have for um, we know that those of you who are preterists, um, especially in expressing your views, you have churches sometimes that will not tolerate what you're doing. And um, especially when they learn that you are a preterist. And so uh, they either want to kick you out, shut you up, or in some way harass you. We have a, um, uh, for those of you who are like isolated in areas and you're not fellowshipping with anybody, you, you're not having contact with, with people and learning in an environment where you can continue to grow, 
And I just talked to a, a gentleman today um, who is out in New Mexico, and he's feeling that same thing. I had another uh, couple that contacted us last week. They've experienced it, and someone within the past two weeks have experienced it, et cetera. So we know that there are people out there. And even when I, you know, when I got fired for teaching this almost 40 years ago, I felt all alone. And, you know, there was no one like what you guys have. You, you, there was no Facebook. There was no YouTube. There was no books. I mean, none of that was there. I mean, it was like we were walking in the dark and you had no one. And then they shut you out and say, you know, go somewhere and worship, you know, but just don't go here. So I know what that's like. I know what it feels like. And uh, so we now have a Zoom access to our services um, for Bible class and for, you know, the Sunday sermon. And if you want to participate in that, you know, you can send me a note on my Facebook page and I will give you the details of how you can connect with that if you are in that situation. We're not trying to take you from anywhere you want to be. We're trying to simply provide an outlet for those people who want to experience being connected and you you know if you're in class you can participate you can ask questions and um, and you know study just like the rest of us who are there uh, you can do that so that's available for you as well if you are um, concerned and uh, have an interest in that and just contact me on the page or send me an email or whatever here's my email address uh, please don't send me junk mail or anything like that I get enough of that <laughs> but here's my personal email address that you can email me if you want to and I can give you more details on that. Uh, we've got a couple of people, and we've got people on that call from uh, uh, Chicago. There's one on the line. We have some from um, Mississippi, from uh, Louisiana, from Ma uh, Maine, from Texas, um, Arkansas, what's some others, um, Tennessee, and several other places. And, and it's growing all the time. And we haven't really advertised. This is the first time I've really made it any kind of public announcement about it. Um, you know, and so it's just an avenue for you. And um, some people find it very, very enjoyable. They have basically become a part of our congregation through that, um, through that medium. And they study with us. They interact with us. And, and they love it. So, you know, and it, we know it's not for everybody. And so if you get there and you, you don't like it, you know, I mean, you can do what you've been doing, but it's just an avenue for those of you who feel left out. And uh, if you want to come and be a part and, um, you know, participate in that way, uh, you're welcome to do so. But uh, as I said, you know, go to the website, you know, click on the donate button, put in the amount that you want to contribute monthly or a one time. And, uh, and we prefer it monthly because we want some consistency so we can stay the long haul and make a difference uh, to people who probably have never heard this, but also shake up some of the people out there who are teaching all this wild, crazy stuff and um, really make an impact. And you will be a part of that. I think it's historic. And one, one last announcement before I go. I did a debate back in 1994 with uh, a gentleman by the name of Stephen Wiggins. Thank you, uh, Susan. Uh, yes, I believe it is. And um, that debate is on, uh, as a matter of fact, I think I got the VHS tapes. Right here. Uh, yeah, so this was the debate. If you can see that, I don't know if you guys can still see the screen or not. But there it is. And, um, you know, what, I'm doing, what I've done this week, and I've had these for all the time, I've, I've tried to do it myself once, and it was just too tedious. But I'm taking that debate and putting it on a DVD, and I'm also going to um, put it on a digital file and have it available because I think it, you know, one, it's a piece of history. You know, this debate was done back in 1994. These were some of our first debates. I mentioned it to Don, and he said he'd probably do some of his. Well, he said it was a good idea, so he might be doing his debates. He debated Bill Lockwood. Um, I know Jack Scott debated Stephen Wiggins a year before I did. He debated him in 1993. And by the way, that's where Holger came from. If you know Holger Neubauer, Holger was at that debate that Jack did in 1993. And then I did the debate in 1994 uh, with Stephen Wiggins. We were supposed to have a follow-up debate, but he chose not to uh, debate the second time. Uh, you'll find it funny. It is funny uh, in some ways, but it's very serious in others. 
but I think it's a good way for you to see how we have progressed. You know, um, I've made a lot of growth from the time that I did that debate, but even then, it's still a pretty good debate. Now, you know, it's not going to be great as a Don Preston debate. I'll tell you that up front, but I think it's a very good, solid debate. And um, if you want to, you know, look at it was a four night discussion. So if you want to um, have access to that, uh, we're going to make those available as well. And I just thought I'd mention to you so you would know. All right. Well, let me read my comments here. Let's see. It says the Lord's Prayer also is the daily sacrifice of meat, flour used for cakes. That was for trespasses, etc. Daily bread was part of the daily sacrifice for trespasses. In other words. OK, very good. Thank you, Elvin. Um, Tarsha Moore says, I would love to make a donation monthly, Lord willing. Uh, yes, I will. I will um, post that. Um, let me post that right here for you um, um, so that you have it right here since you're here. And then we'll do it again if, if you happen to uh, miss it. But all you do is go to this website and you'll see a donate button and just click on that and enter your amount and then check the box for monthly and that will take care of it. But this definitely helps us. You know, we're, we're not a, a large congregation as far as that uh, numbers are concerned, but what keeps amazing me is what God does through us, you know, even with our size. And yet at the same time, we know there are a lot of preterists scattered around the country who are, you know, one person here, one person there, even the guy that I talked to, he said there were five individuals right there with him. And uh, they're all kind of just spotted there. And so we try to find, and because we're so scattered out across the country, it's kind of hard to pull us together. But with technology, you know, we're able to do it. And so that's what we have. Well, again, um, you know, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you very much. Um, I, I am amazed at the talent and knowledge that you all have. And if you think that I don't read your comments and your, uh, as you're studying and conversing with people, I do. And sometimes I just sit back and say, wow, you know, I write this down. I write that down because you taught me something. And uh, so we're just grateful for the opportunity to work with you. Appreciate you all. Love you all. And um, have a good night. Look forward to being back with you on next week. And, um, and you know, may God bless and keep you. And again, thanks. You skipped the uh, question. Oh, sorry, sorry. Let me not cancel then. Uh, I mean, let me cancel the close. Where is the question? Oh, is that the top? It's in Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. Okay, that's what I'm saying. It must be at the top. Okay. It's at the top. Uh, I got the Lord's Prayer. I see the Babylon information. Oh, okay. I have a question regarding the eighth day celebration. What calendar do you follow regarding it? Was it the Gregorian or the lunar calendar? Well, if it was the, um, I, the Hebrews didn't use the Gregorian calendar. So it would have been, as far as I understood, a lunar calendar. Would you attest to that, uh, Elvin? Uh, yes, sir, indeed. Well, I think she's asking, like, do we still follow that lunar calendar, oh, calendar oh, right, now. Well, well, right now? You know, because, first of all, um, we're not following those feast days because they were types and shadows of the true feast days, which have all been fulfilled in Christ. So now we are in the eighth day festival, which is the eternal rest, and uh, that day has no end. So that's one of the reasons why in the book of Revelation, the Bible says the city has no need of the sun or the moon for the lamb, God and the lamb lightens the city. And another reason for the sun and the moon were for, you know, because in Genesis, it says what's for days and times and seasons, etc. So we're not keeping those feast days and marking off time from that perspective, um, because all of those feast days are fulfilled in Christ, who is our eternal day. And uh, so that's how I would see it. Okay. Does that satisfy everybody for tonight? Well, thanks very much. I'd love to hear some feedback from some of the preachers out there. I know some of you are on the line, so I'd like to hear some of your feedback and uh, kind of let us know what's going on in your head. Um, and I know some of you have asked to study. 
I had a good brother call today and and I wanted to study. So uh, we're open to that. Just contact us and, you know, we'll do it in a very, you know, respectful way. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Have a good night and uh, we'll see you at the next appointed time.